it is interesting. I mean, we, we are at such an interesting time in America. And I know it's in a in a in a time of increasing tyr- tyranny. I, I know I saw uh, the Cato Institute just ranked New Hampshire as the freest state in the country. Uh, and I know, um, <laughs> you know, I have to imagine it has something to do with, you know, the, the courage I've seen in New Hampshire that I haven't seen in other states, which is to resist the temptation of federal dollars. This is because this is one of the mechanisms by which Washington, D.C. controls the states. And I, and I don't think I don't think the American people, by and large, get this um, is. You know, Washington, D.C. cannot impose its tyrannical policies across the country without the complicity of the state governments. And the way that it gets that complicity is it steals our money from us and it ransoms it back with strings attached. So. And at a discount. So they take, you know, they take a dollar, but they only give you 70 cents back, too. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, all of the special interests get the Washington, D.C. special interests get their cut of your money before it comes back to you. And then when you do get that whatever's left over, when you do get those scraps from the table back, they're always conditional. Oh, you want. These federal highway funds, well, you better pass these policies that we say that you have to pass, whether they be, you know, speed limits or seatbelt laws or what with the dr- the drinking age. These are these are all law. These are all these are all policies that the federal government never had any constitutional authority to set. Whatever you think about the policies, someone might like the seatbelt law or the speed limits or the drinking age where it is. We can have policy debates on those sorts of things. Personally, the seatbelt law is a particular just like I just, it just it just drives me crazy. The government, I'm for wearing seatbelts. I'm all uh, hey, you know, I think you're stupid if you don't, but at the at the same time, I don't like the government sticking a gun in your face and saying you better do this for your own good or else. Um, and that's, of course, what's always behind every single government policy. There's always a person with a gun threatening consequences if you don't do what you're told. And that, hey, that's fine by me if we're talking about protecting life, liberty, or property. It's not fine to me when we're talking about doing things in your own personal life that affect no one other than yourself. But New Hampshire is the only state in the entire union that, to date, has told the federal government to take its money – it's really our money <laughs> – <laughs> say we're not going to dance to your tune but we don't have a seatbelt law for adults and we're not going we're not going to have one and i imagine this has held true for many other times too and i think that ability to resist the so-called free money from washington dc is something i don't see uh, in, in the backbones of 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 the political class in other states uh and of course it's we talk about seatbelt laws may seem silly but they're trying to do this right now with red flag gun confiscation orders mm-hmm. saying if you want federal funds you better have a law in place that allows state agents to confiscate firearms from individuals not charged with any crimes with no due process of the law they're trying to pass that in washington dc and and make federal funds contingent to the states uh, on that so uh, w- the states have got to stand up and say no more of this and fight back how is new hampshire is it just that live free or die attitude like how has new hampshire resisted this temptation for so long Yeah, I mean, sadly, given the COVID situation and there was a lot of money that came in, New Hampshire's always been a net payer. So we were paying more to the federal government than we ever received back. And that was actually one of the most compelling arguments I saw for independence, right? It was like, well, we could just make a purely economic argument. We're getting less than we're giving. We're, We're giving more than we're getting. So it just plainly does not make economic sense, regardless of the other reasons. Um, I believe I just read something recently that said that is no longer the case. I have not crunched those numbers myself. I don't really know, given what money was flowing in with what grants. I know that there were there was a lot of concern here about um, some of the. The, the grants that were coming in for either vaccinations or for testing, you know, all of the stuff uh, associated with COVID that um, had some bells and whistles in the grant applications that basically said, oh, you are now the federal government's, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know what the polite word is, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and, you now and have to so, do what we tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, 
So it is a little troubling. We have really towed, you know, held the line on that for a really long time. I don't think we have a hundred percent, you know, the 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 best record. Now I'm going to assume if we slid, everyone else is way worse than we were, right? So more people are taking more money, but that is definitely something we need to look at. Um, one of the really cool things I think that's coming up for for this legislative session is a constitutional amendment that would be put in front of the voters. So, um, and it's called CACR 32, I believe. And it is an independence bill. It's, it's uh, suggesting that we should amend the New Hampshire constitution to just peacefully go our separate way from the federal government. And I'm sure to some extent, it's just an issue of starting that conversation as a more formal thing than me just, you know, going around the country talking to random people yeah. about it. But, um, but, you know, it's interesting, again, when I was at that conference in Miami, people were like, well, but what if it passes, you know, because I was like, don't worry, it'll take 10 years, well, you know, we have time and we can figure out the details, get the policy right, make sure we're you know, energy independent with some nuclear, like there's a lot of exciting things we we can and should be doing. Um, but then someone was like, it's been really weird politically. What happens if this just passes? And I was <laughs> like, if that is the will of Granite Staters, then let's do it, right? There's nothing undemocratic about what we're suggesting. You know, it's very democratic. One hundred percent. Right. I mean, I think, you know, the pushback would really come from the federal government, but it's a bill that would put it in front of voters. Uh, we have passed several constitutional amendments in the 12, 13 years I've been here, including a really good privacy bill that has to do with information and government interference in our personal information, which I would love to see a lawsuit get pushed on some of this, uh, you know, vaccine tracking and all of that. Um, I should also mention one of the really good things that came out of 2021 was we do have a no vaccine mandate. Um, ban. So, so we can't have forcible vaccinations. Uh, you can as a private company and as it should be, although like my freedom part doesn't really like this because I do feel like we're using private companies or the federal government is kind of strong arming yeah. private companies to do their dirty work for them. Uh, but the private companies can still have a mandate as a condition of your employment. The hospitals have done that and uh, they have done it with healthcare, but everyone else cannot, you know, they cannot institute a, a um, you know, <laughs> bear with me, a super callous, fascist, risky, and experimental doses. Wait, super callous, fascist, risky, experimental doses with a spoonful of sugar. <laughs> so, um, so that was a big win too. Uh, but because the federal dollars are attached to that, I think things got a little murky and we're going to have to parse yeah. that out. You know, I, I, I'll say, you know, Here's one idea I, I've I've been pushing more and more, and I've been talking to some of my state legislator friends across the country about about this idea. Um, you know, is um, standing up to to the federal government through a form of tax nullification. I remember reading just I remember reading Tom Wood's book Nullification years ago, and it was like such a little. It was almost like just on one page. It was like a throwaway thing, but it but it just like it, something clicked in my head, and I thought this is kind of a brilliant idea. Maybe it wouldn't work. Maybe I, I don't know. I think you'd have to have a couple states doing this together to stand up against Washington D.C. But the idea would be, what if, let's say, let's take the state of New Hampshire. What if the state of New Hampshire passed a law saying? The people of New Hampshire no longer pay their federal taxes directly to Washington, D.C. They pay their federal taxes to the state of New Hampshire that holds it in trust. Well, there are legislative committees that review the federal budget and review the items in the federal budget on the basis of constitutionality. And then we will pay to the federal government that percentage, which this legislative committee finds to be constitutional so powers exercised within article 1 section 8 or some other you know place in the constitution where they were actually explicitly granted these powers to do these certain things um you know hey may, hey we're not going to pay for an unconstitutional war in syria that congress never declared we're not going to pay for unconstitutional one size fits all education programs that 
just, you know, funnel billions of dollars into bureaucracy and send only the barest minuscule amount to, to classrooms. No, we're not going to pay for that stuff. And then what I like about this idea is that it puts the state in the position of the federal government can't threaten to withhold your federal funds because you've got the federal funds. All right. All right. So you're not going to fund our highways. That's that's fine. We'll fund our own highways. And you know what? Uh, we'll we'll supplant that we'll supplant the money that you threaten to take away with us with these with these funds, and then we'll send the rest back to the people that you wanted to steal it from. Um, I love it, love it. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's. I'm I'm making a note. Tax nullification <laughs> to go with all forms of nullification. <laughs> maybe 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 2022 after we get this new kind of wave of uh, the red wave, putting liberty legislators into the state capitals across the country. Perhaps we can have a renewed effort. You know, across the states for something like that. But uh, I, there are so many ways that we need to fight back against the federal government. And I am just, I'm just, you know, it's great in so many. We've, you know, we've got liberty legislators in 37 states now, but nowhere do we have the, nowhere is there the critical mass like there is in New Hampshire. And I'm just, I'm just uh, amazed every day. The infrastructure, the, the the infrastructure that you all have built up over the course of the last 10 years. I remember going to my first you know, Porcupine Freedom Festival, you know, in 2012, right after the, the Ron Paul campaign. And it was just packed with people from across the country, you know, coming to New Hampshire, this vibrant liberty community. And after the Ron Paul campaigns, that seemed to die down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But geez, I went back to Pork Fest this past year. And this was the first year that you guys sold out completely. And here's what I love. I, I love the community. I love the fact that when I go to the Porcupine Freedom Festival, it's people who love freedom and liberty and that's a common denominator culturally i mean i i've talked with people there i've talked with people who are you know transgender activists who we would think much more kind of like on the left socially and i say more power to them i'm glad that they're in this movement and i talk to very very socially conservative Christ uh, christians who are there too and i say more power to you i'm glad you're in this movement liberty is supposed to be a big tent as long as we agree on these on these foundational principles of I get to live my life how I want, as long as I'm not hurting others, you get to live life how you want, as long as you're not hurting others. And if we disagree on certain things in these personal spheres, then we have the right to use the force of persuasion to try to bring other people to agree with us. But if we can agree that we're not going to use violence, we're not going to use coercion to try to compel peaceful people to live the way that we think they should, you know, then I think that's that's. That's just got the makings for something great that you're bringing all these people together. I look forward to seeing what the, the, the future holds for the Free State Project. And as we go into the future, as we go into here we are in 2022, what are you, I guess, what are you thinking is going to, what, what, what is the Free State Movement going to look like in 2022 and perhaps beyond? So, I mean, we're growing like gangbusters. So I think we're just going to see more and more growth. And, you know, we had, uh, I can't even keep up anymore. I used to know everyone and now there are just thousands of people and there are these move-in parties and sometimes I'll get really nervous. So when a family moves and they bring their U-Haul, if they let us know, hey, we're going to be here at this date, uh, you know, scores of people show up. And something in the back of my mind recently, I was like, gosh, does anyone even like still show up to those? And then I saw a post really right before I came on here where it was this woman who was like, yeah, we we showed up at three o'clock and by 3.15, our truck was unloaded. Like <laughs> that many people just came to help. So I think, you know, our community is going to grow. We have several events that are coming up um, that I'm always excited about. We have Porcupine Day, which will be uh, the first weekend in February. And that's just more a community based thing where we get together to celebrate triggering the move and kind of starting this exodus to our libertarian homeland. And then, uh, of course, we have Liberty Forum, which is the first weekend in March. That's a little more suit and tie. Uh, you know, it's a hotel conference. Uh, great speakers, Corey DeAngelis, you know, school choice, money. Um, budgets, like all the nerdy wonkish policy kind of stuff, um, uh, but also community and meeting people and just networking and sort of, you know, building, building our, our, our tribe. And then as you mentioned, uh, yeah, we have a uh, pork fest, the porcupine freedom festival, that's P O R C F E S T. So don't show up and ask me, where's the barbecue? Uh, <laughs> Because oh, there are, every there, year. 
<laughs> Though there are there are always vendors uh, that that uh, set up selling some of the best barbecue and so many other things you'll ever find. Yes, <laughs> and and we do actually have a pork roast, so it does get confusing. But it is the Porcupine Freedom Festival, as you said. That's going to be June twentieth through the twenty sixth. People should buy their tickets as soon as possible. We're already about two thirds sold out. The campground can only handle so many people. It's pretty rustic. Um, I encourage people to buy their tickets and then start to look at hotels around, come camp if you can, find some Airbnbs in the area. I have heard vastly wild rumors about who is going to be showing up, but the names I've heard is everything from, you know, Alex Jones and Tim from Timcast and uh, maybe Joe Rogan. I know Luke Radowski, you know, is always there and will come back. Um, so it really does sound like, you know, if you're ever going to come to one of these, this would be the year to come. That's a good um, reminder. I got to get my ticket before it's too late. You know, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, it was it, it, it was it was actually th this was this was great. When I went to Pork Fest this past year, it was um, I, I got my ticket. But the, all the campsites were were kind of booked at a certain point. And I was like, oh, no, what I'm going to do? I should have moved on this sooner. I just put out the word like, hey, has anyone got an open spot on a campsite? And like within minutes, I got like I've heard from a, a you know half dozen people. I end up, you know, Matt Kibbe of Free the People nice. and his whole clan kind of took me in for <laughs> for the uh, for 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 the week. And uh, it was anyway. And of course, they'll be back. And they're going to have this huge hub and sort of one yeah. of the things we've done this year, which or uh, Dennis Pratt, who's been organizing it, doing a phenomenal job. He uh, he sort of came up with this notion of if we invite other people who are doing cool things to come do little islands of their stuff on the campground. Now, suddenly we have, you know, a festival that's primarily self-organizing and um, and people are doing what they're passionate about. So you're doing your passion projects, you're meeting people. So free the people will be there again. I'm hoping Dave Smith and Robbie will come out again. Lou Perez will be out. Uh, I'd love to see more comedians. I think, you know, uh, politics is downstream from culture. We've all heard that a million times. Uh, that's why I write books. That's why, you know, I talk uh, and go on the road and all of that. But I think we need more comedians and, you know, face it. I mean, totalitarianism and the, the cognitive dissonance and the irrational, illogical, bananas, crazy stuff we've gone through. I mean, the material just purely writes itself at this stage. Um, and then, so those are sort of the social things and the stuff that, you know, we're just doing community wise. But then we also have, you know, I think we're gonna see some interesting things in the legislature. And I think we're gonna see the most free staters and Liberty people run who have ever run. And I'm pretty hopeful that we can make the Democrats heads explode. <laughs> well, if you live in any of these states across America, except for Maine, you got to stay in Maine. <laughs> I'm losing too, I'm many, <laughs> too many good Liberty people just to, to New Hampshire. Um, but uh, uh, but it, so anywhere other than Maine, if you're looking for a good uh, Liberty community, you'll definitely want to check out the Free State Project in, in New Hampshire. And I will say, you know, I, I got to give credit. My first the first time I was ever exposed to Bitcoin was uh, at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum in 2012. I, I met these guys who were just kind of like trying to sell this idea, uh, you know, promote the idea of Bitcoin. And it was new. And I was like, well, I don't know. What is this? And he gave out, he was giving out to people, here, I'll give you five cents worth of Bitcoin. And so I was like, all right. And it was, it was stuck on my wallet for, you know, I, I checked in on it like 10 years, like uh, not 10 years, a couple of years later. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this thing is worth $10 now. This was five cents. Mm -hmm. And you know what I think? I should have listened to that guy. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, you you, you should have. And, 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 you know, I had a podcast. It was very briefly lived podcast called Told You So. You can find it on Podbean <laughs> for the people who are curious. But, you know, we, we, free staters were early, early adopters. I bought my first Bitcoin for $6 at Pork Fest. I think it was 2011. That same, like, early crew, right? I mean, I yeah. spent it, you know, so everyone has regrets. Everyone has a sad Bitcoin story. But, you know, I think uh, people are also going to 
start doing quite well with that. So much so, actually, and I would love to see more crypto businesses come to New Hampshire. Yeah. Why is crypto important? That federal government and the Federal Reserve collude to steal our money. Inflation is a tax, an invisible tax on the poor. It hurts poor people the most. Yeah. It is insidious. It is evil. And it needs to stop. They won't listen to us. They won't stop printing money. So we have to take matters into our own, own hands. And that is what crypto is. Now, crypto, like any Nansen industry, it's a little scammy. It can be confusing. But if people have questions, come to our events because most of the people who are involved in that sector here are vetted. We all know each other. It's not the weird, shady, fishy stuff. And come learn because we, you know, crypto is going to be a hedge against inflation. I personally think we may be heading into a hyperinflationary sort of situation. We are definitely not in transitionary. <laughs> We're transitioning to hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, so everyone's got a sad crypto story, but I would like to see some happy crypto stories come out too. Sadly, we have uh, two different groups of free staters who are, are being pursued by the federal government currently yeah. with regard to crypto. There's the Crypto Six out of uh, Keen. You know, they ran some Bitcoin ATMs. Um, and then, of course, uh, the founder, he also serves on the Free State Project board, Jeremy Kaufman and his company library. And the irony here is the federal government won't tell you or the SEC won't tell you, uh, is it a security? Is it a token? You know, what is it? And if you ask, they'll be like, we don't know. Ask your lawyer. Then you do what your lawyers advise. And then they come back and they're like, well, no, that's not right. And it's like, tell me how to fix it. I would like to be in compliance. And they're like, no, ask your lawyer. So, you know, you'll spend a million, literal million dollars on lawyers and still get pursued. So it is political. We know that uh, they hate crypto because it is so disruptive to their, you know, to their, their interests. I have heard people say, we don't like the libertarians and we don't like the free staters and we don't like the crypto people because the wrong people are getting rich. And I'm like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is it is the the fiat dollar. And I, and I hate to even call it the dollar because the dollar was, you know, the gold standard. <laughs> right. You know, uh, they destroyed that in uh, uh, over, you know, officially destroyed that in the 70s. And ever since that, the dollar, the dollar is the mechanism by which the empire controls the people and controls the economy and cryptocurrency decentralized finance is a direct challenge to that. They're threatened by it and they should feel threatened by it. And I think that crypto is going to win and amen to that. So uh, we are at the end of the hour. We got to wrap up wow. here, but I know time flies when you, well, I know we have too much fun together. <laughs> Carla, any final words you want to share with folks before we wrap up today? No, I guess, you know, it's Martin Luther King Day. So maybe, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes, I got into so well, many Twitter storms. So oh, we're recording this on later. Martin Luther King Day. This will record now. Well, now everyone's going to see the illusion, but that's fine. We record this on Martin Luther King Day. This will air on Sunday. Oh, but we can cut this part out. Say. Oh, I was just going to say, I got a lot of uh, trouble on, on the Twitter sphere today because, you know, I said, I believe like Martin Luther King in the content of people's character. And uh, that is the only thing that we should be judged on as, as humans. Apparently that is racist, but I did want to leave. It's not, of course not. But, um, you know, he did say that the greatest purveyor of violence on earth is my own government. And I think we need to keep that in mind. I want peace. I want yeah. prosperity. And we only get that by having small, limited constitutional government or a free and independent New Hampshire. Awesome. Carla, thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. 